see so many friends and colleagues in the audience. Because of the mixed background, I will try to give uh, a more of an overview talk, but I want to focus on JD6. So when I talk about JD6, I'll be working quantum JD6, I'll be working within a particular framework. I mean, there are many approaches to knock metered geometry, but the idea is that there should be an algebra A, which is the coordinate algebra of the manifold, but now it could be non-commutative. And there should be a space, a, a bimodule over A, which is omega one, which is the space of differential one forms. So all you need to know from geometry is in classical geometry, there is an algebra and there is a space of one forms. And we just allow that to be somewhat general, uh, but we keep the a derivation. Well, I'll show you the axioms in a minute. But what really distinct, and that's common to most, including Alain Kahn's approach to most forms of knockage geometry, what's special to what uh, Edwin Beggs and I called quantum Riemannian geometry um, is that there is a metric G is an, is an actual tensor in omega one tensor omega one. So you don't get that in Alain, Alain's framework. And then there's a connection, which is, which is written like this. And usually a connection that will cover a derivative would give a vector field, it would get an operator. So, but here we just leave this blank to evaluate against a vector field. So it's like a co-action in quantum groups. This is waiting to evaluate against a vector field, which would then give you a, a covariant derivative. And then what's really interesting is that out of the Leibniz rule for derivate for covariant derivatives, we will extract the, the, the um, natural place for this operator, a bimodule map here, which we call the generalized, which is called the generalized braiding. So these, so this will be a kind of connection which admits this map. And this map here has a lot of marvelous properties. Classically, it's just the, the flip map. So you wouldn't even think of it. You wouldn't, it wouldn't, wouldn't cause you even to blink, right? When you transpose tensors. But in quantum geometry, that map is going to play a critical role. And it's got, and it can, under nice cases, obey the Yang-Baxter equations, and is intimately linked with integral systems and all those things. So I want to show you that. Now, my uh, motivation, um, and many motivations, one is that graph geometry is a special case of quantum Riemannian geometry. Another is that quantum groups have a natural, just as Lee, Man Lee, Lee groups are a natural example of, 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 man of Riemannian manifolds, so um, compact Lee groups. Uh, so quantum groups are natural examples of quantum Riemannian geometry, to, to, to uh, some extent at least. And of course, it contains the continuum geometry in the limit. Now, I want to, I will show you, before I get to the main topic, I will show you an application to uh, a graph. And here the graph is just a chain, like a, like in a, like a spin chain integral systems. And I'll show you that a, a, the, geom the intrinsic Riemannian geometry of a chain is already Q-deformed without mentioning any quantum groups. So that, that's a nice result that came out in this paper in JMP. Then I'll talk about GD6. And this is something which this approach to GD6, both classically and in the quantum case, this really comes from Edwin Beggs's paper here. And then we followed it up re most recently in this paper. And then I will tie it all together at the end if I have time. It's, it, um, okay. So the. <clears throat> Do I have to get the focus here? Okay. So uh, for this audience, I don't want to say too much, but just remember that classically, C infinity of a manifold would be the degree zero part of the exterior algebra, which would have the components in all degrees, focusing on the one forms. They would be things like F. Hmm. Yeah, thought this was working. It's there, yeah, FDG. But classically, of course, they would commute. FDG would same as G. And what D would be would be this differential, which sends a function into a differential like this. And really, XIL local coordinates, and this actually defines the part. So D is, is intrinsically defined, but on a manifold. And then this, these, this formula defines the partial derivatives. Uh, of course, there's a wedge product of higher order differential forms obeying the graded Leibniz rule and graded commutative. Now, in the non-commutative case, we keep all of this except we throw away any kind of commutativity. So A is an algebra over a field. We drop the graded commutativity and the commutativity here, but we keep the associativity, which means that omega one is a bimodule. You can multiply associatively from the left or the right uh, a differential by a function. And there's a D operator which obeys the Leibniz rule. This is really tells you how differential calculus. 
and omega one should be spanned by differentials like this um, subjectivity condition. If you work with DGAs in other contexts, then you wouldn't usually have subjectivity. But if you don't, you can just look at the image of at this image, and that defines you a, proper, a calculus in our sense inside a DGA. Anyway, you can extend it uh, to a DGA, a first order one to a DGA. There's there's at least one canonical way given omega one, but there are other ways also. Um, I think the battery is very low on this. Uh, um, no one's got any spare battery. No. Okay. I'm just going to point. Um, so yeah, you'll take the tensor algebra. Occasionally it comes up. It's a little bit faint. Um, tensor algebra quotient by some ideal. Okay. That's, we won't worry too much about omega two and higher. Um, now, the, the fun stuff is really the Ramanian bit. So we have a metric G of element of, of omega one tensor omega one. We had, so geometrically, geometers would write something like ds squared is like this. But what they really mean is it's a tensor product. And it's a tensor product over the algebra of functions, which is why it's not like a, a one form tensor or one form over the field, because then you have x and y independent points on the manifold. But these are at the same point. And so that's there's only one g mu nu of x as a one function of x. So that's why it's a tensor product over the, over the algebra. So it's a bit of a, a conversion from the standard way in textbooks for Ramanian geometry and the algebraic way. But honestly, the algebraic way is much cleaner and uh, to my, in my opinion, much nicer even for classical geometry. Now we require a bimodule inverse. That means a map going the other way, making omega one a rigid object in the category, in the category of AA bimodules. It just means that if you read down the page, then if you apply, um, you, you apply, you, you view the metric as element of omega one tensor omega one. And then on the right here, you know what, I'm just gonna use the mouse. Uh, on the right here, you, um, over here, you apply the, the the round bracket, and you should get back the identity. It's similar on the other side. So, if there were matrices, then these if there were matrices or tensors governing these these objects, then they'd just be saying that the matrix for this is the inverse of the matrix for this. Now, it turns out that this is actually quite strong and implies it to be required it to be central. You don't require G to be central everywhere, but if you want, uh, and you certainly don't need it to have a connection. Uh, there's a lot of misunderstanding about that. But the nicest case is if G is, sent, is if G has this inverse, uh, which then makes G central. Now a connection, as I mentioned, is uh, is a map like this. So imagine, uh, yeah. So the Leibniz property of a, of a Kerman derivative just comes out like this, where f is in the algebra and omega is a one form. Now that's fine from the left. That will be a left connection in the standard sense, going back to Quillen, uh, Karubi, in the seventies. Uh, but what we have, since we have since omega one is a bimodule, we've also got multiplication from the right. So we would like something similar. The nabla omega f should be bring out f, and then it should be omega tensor df. But the problem with omega tensor df is when you couple it to a vector field, you'll be coupling it to the far left component to be consistent here. Um, but then then the, that vector has to couple to the df. So you need something to flip these two. So you need a bimodule map that flips these two. So, um, so that's the not so if, if a connection admits if a left connection admits such a map, then uh, that map is uniquely determined. So it's not additional data. It's just that some connections are compatible with a bimodule structure in this way, and some are not. Some left connections. So we work with such bimodule connections. Uh, I should have put the reference here. This was originally introduced by Peter Michor and Dubois Violet, uh, but we use it a lot in the in the yellow book. Now. Um, the uh, bimodule connections have the nice property that the category of bimodules equipped with bimodule connection is a monoidal category. It's closed on the tensor product. So in particular, omega one tensor omega one will acquire itself a connection, the tensor product connection, just as in classical Ramanian geometry. And that connection is just to act on the first component, act on the second component, and then use sigma to put the argument of the, the, the left argument of nabla has to go to the far left. You'll see it in this picture. Here I've applied the G. G is an element of omega one tensor omega one. I apply nabla to one leg. I apply nabla to the second leg. But then this, this output of nabla has to go to the far left, which is what the map sigma does. So when you have a bimodule connection, there's an intrinsic, intrinsic extension to tensor products. And G is in the tensor product. So uh, 
in the element of omega one tensor omega one. So we have a natural immediate meaningful metric compatibility. So, so that was the really, and there are different approaches. There was an earlier frame bundle approach, which didn't require a biological connection, but this is the, this is the one which is like the nicest approach. Now, uh, a quantum Levy uh, Vita connection would be one where Nabla G is zero and where the torsion is also zero. So again, what is the torsion? So again, you can look up formulas in geometry books, but the algebraic way is much cleaner. The torsion is just the two different ways to go from omega one into omega two. One is directly by the exterior derivative, and the other is by applying Nabla and then applying the wedge product. So Nabla will go into omega one tensor omega one, the wedge product will take you into omega two. And for those two to be equal, that's what torsion free means. Uh, curvature, well, curvature is just Nabla squared corrected uh, in, in order to uh, be a, a left module map here. And uh, here, curvature maps into omega two. It, it, usually in books, again, you will evaluate against a pair of vector fields, but actually it only depends on the pair antisymmetrically. So really it's a two form output. Uh, now, the curvature is an area which is not fully understood. In, at the moment, what we do is just copy the physicist's definition, but I wouldn't say it's a deep understanding. Okay, so the physicist's definition is basically, if you are algebraist, basically it looks like this. You take the Riemann curvature, apply it to one forms. Now you're in omega 2 tensor omega 1. But then you, then you classically, you would lift a two form into an antisymmetric pair of one forms. So you would, you would view a two form as anti-symmetric combination of one forms. And that's basically a lifting process from omega two into omega one tensor omega one. Again, you wouldn't even notice this map classically because you would just write, you would pretend that it's obvious. Um, but we, we would regard, we identify this map. Once we've got uh, this, then we can take a trace like that. You don't have to use the metric and inverse metric, but you can just take a trace. And then, and then um, uh, we live in omega one tensor omega one. Once you're, and that's the Ricci curvature. And then the Ricci scalar is just to, just to evaluate that further with a round bracket metric. Now, over complex numbers, which is what we're interested in, um, we, A should be a star algebra. The star should extend to, the, to omega, omega. And there are conditions on G and Nabla, which I won't tell you in detail, but they ensure that uh, everything in the classical case would be real. And um, also, we want some kind of integration, but that we'll want a positive linear functional with certain properties. Now, once you've got this data, you can do quantum gravity. So anyone who says, oh, we can't do quantum gravity, uh, that's sort of true. But the problems with quantum gravity are not to do with the structure. They're to do with the infinities that arise when you integrate over a functional space of all metrics. But if you let the algebra be, be finite dimensional, uh, and at, uh, and omega one, more importantly, to be finite dimensional, then the space of metrics is actually finite dimensional. And the space of metrics and connections, I didn't say connection was unique here, so you might have to integrate over the moduli of pairs, but the space of metrics and connections is some finite dimensional space. And, and so you can just do that. You can just integrate over that moduli, e to the i over g is the, is the coupling constant times the integral of the, of the scalar curvature. So that would be the Einstein-Hilbert action. So you've already got quantum gravity just handed to you, and you can begin to do calculations. I, I won't give all the references in this talk, but if you want to afterwards, I can tell you. Um, but one thing you find in, in the papers where there are about four models which have been computed, and um, one of them is the fuzzy sphere, another is, um, is our, our graphs, like polygons. Um, you, you have log divergences for the expectation values of the metric. That, so, so that's not too surprising. It's a quantum field theory, but the ratios of, of the standard deviation of the of the of the um, metric divided by the metric, uh, those things are all finite. So you have a well-defined theory. Uh, I mean, you can also do it by normalization, but the simple thing is just to look at, at scale invariant quantities, and then these scale invariant quantities are all well-defined. So, um, okay. I want to show you an example related to integrable systems. I don't quite know how. Um, so we let the algebra just be functions on a lattice of n points, a, a chain. And so the, the A is spanned by delta function, the delta function at the point i, the vertex i. Um, we can also let n go to infinity, little n go to infinity, which is the natural numbers. Now, omega one is, we're going to have arrows in both directions between the nodes. So in, when, you in, when you interpret graph as a, a graph as a quantum Riemannian geometry, each arrow becomes a differential form. 
So omega one as a vector space is spanned over the field K by the AIs going that way and the AI primes going the other way. And because, um, well, with these relations, uh, this just specifies for you the bimodule structure. Um, there's, uh, for any graph, there's a kind of natural extension to higher orders, which we call omega min, and that has these relations. And then you can add some further relations if you want, you can quotient it further. And uh, by hand, it's not canonical. And here we encode these relations. Now these relations are relations of the pre-projective algebra of type, of type AN. So this is related to the to integral to, to Dinkin, Dinkin diagrams of type AN. And so they're quite a natural thing to add. So we take that calculus. And then, and then we ask, okay, do there exist levative either connections and metrics? And the answer is no, actually, unless the metric, and I didn't say what the metric is. A metric, I told you an element of omega one tends to omega one. If you think really hard about it, from what I've told you, you can figure out that what a metric then amounts to is a real number attached to every, every arrow. So a metric is just decorating the graph with, with lengths, if you like, for the arrows. Uh, although bizarrely, you don't require the length from A to B to be the same as the length from B to A, you just don't need it. And, um, and, the, uh, and in fact, if you insist that it's edge symmetric, that the lengths are equal, there, there, doesn't, there isn't going to exist a levity of connection. That's what we prove in this paper with Alcato Kiraz. Uh, but rather, what happens is the length going one way, let's say going to the right, has to be a, a certain multiple of the length going the other way. And those multiples are fixed uh, by this. I mean, the, there is more than one solution, but the, nat the canonical solution, which applies for all n, for small, for individual n, there's more solutions, but the natural solution for all n is, is, is to take this q to form the integer. So here q is e to the pi i over m plus one. Phi i is just the q integer i plus one over the q integer i. Those are, those are real uh, numbers. And so, um, and so the theorem is that if you take that choice, then there does exist a limit of either connection. Um, in fact, there's a one parameter one labeled by a, a complex parameter, uh, but you can also just take that parameter to be real. And then uh, and the parameter has to be mod one. So in fact, there's two plus or minus one if you want to keep everything real. Uh, so, it's, so, so that gives you what the moduli looks like. What's a bit mysterious is where's quantum group? Because if you've got Q integers, you must have a quantum group somewhere. And probably the quantum group UQSL n plus one for Q, this particular root of unity, probably acts as some kind of diffeomorphism uh, group or isotropy group or something, but we haven't managed to figure that out. And the other thing about this, this effect, this is, is that it's an effect coming from the boundary. You can see that most clearly if you set n to infinity. So then you've got an infinite line going in one direction, uh, starting at, at one, the natural numbers. And then this phi i, it looks like this because Q goes to infinity, Q goes to one here and goes to infinity. This Q goes to one. You just get I plus one over I. So that's something which in the bulk far away from one is just one. So, you, so the metric is the same in both directions, far from, far from the bound, boundary at, at one. But at the boundary on the left, as you approach the boundary, you get this effect coming in. And, um, and so, so it's some kind of interaction between the geometry of the boundary and the, and the Romanian geometry inside. I, I'm not going to say the words holographic principle. Okay, now we're going to talk about um, classical uh, geodesics. And to, so firstly, I mean, I can take questions here if you want. This is the end of the formalism. Okay, it's a bit of a lightning introduction. Now I want to try to focus on the specific topic of the lecture. So I want you to first think about ordinary geodesics on a Romanian manifold. If you imagine not one, not one particle, normally you think about particles moving on a manifold. If you imagine not one particle, but a dust of particles. And if you take all their tangent vectors, then and assume the dust is kind of smoothly distributed, then the tangent vectors will, will smooth out into a, into a fit vector field over the manifold. And the vector field will evolve with geodesic time. I'm gonna call the geodesic time parameter S. So XS is, a, is an S, a time dependent, vector field on the manifold. And it turns out that this vector field obeys a nice equation, which is this one here, the geodesic velocity equation. And this captures the essence of being a geodesic, right? Because a geodesic has the tangent direction. The derivative in the tangent direction is itself given by the covariant derivative of the connection. But if you ever looked in geometry books, it always puzzled me as a student, how, why a geodesic was defined by equation involving a connection 
on a vector field, but it wasn't acting on a vector field. It's acting on the tangent vector at a, a, on a long line, which is not a vector field. So the formula in physics was never ever made any sense, okay? Because you had a coming to acting on a vector field, but but, it, but that vector field wasn't defined. It's only defined along the line of the, of the of the particle. But it turns out that that's not really not the right way of thinking about it. The right way of thinking about it is this this way. And so you have a vector field, and then and then to recover the actual particles, you would have to look at the flow of the density. So the density obeys this equation here. So this would so you could start off with some initial density and then integrate this equation to get how the density flows. So what you've done is you've taken the concept of a geodesic and you've torn it apart into two pieces, the the, and then you've glued them together in the wrong order. So normally you think of the location of the particle first and then its tangent vector. But we start we reverse the order and think about the tangent vector field first without mentioning where the particles are, and then we reconstruct the flow of the particles afterwards. Okay, it's a very alien, it's a very alien way of thinking about things, um, but uh, one which I find very appealing, and and it, and it's in Edwin's paper here. Now, if you take um, if you now the next thing that we do is we go one step further and we take a quantum mechanical point of view. So we let rho be the be the be the amplitude square of some the modular square of some wave function psi, and then what corresponds to this is this equation here okay this this will induce this over here so this is the we call this the amplitude flow equation so this is the quantum mechanical version of gds evolution given that you already know the tangent vectors now to see why this is actually very elegant even in classical geometry you can look at the convective derivative so if you have a fluid motion if you have a fluid in fluid mechanics it's very natural to look at the convective derivative that is the derivative experienced as you flow with the particle and so that is just the derivative d by ds, but corrected by the vector field itself acting. Um, so now if you take the convective derivative of the divergence of xs itself, the divergence of the vector field, so that would encode that would encode GDS converging or GDS expanding. It's, its convective derivative turns out to be some kind of kinetic energy term plus the Ricci tensor. So that's how the, and if you're a geometer, you will know that the Ricci tensor controls how a ball of dust changes its shape as it falls. It, it will it experience stresses. That's the stress energy tensor, which is why it's matched in Einstein's equation to the stress energy. But it, it experiences, if it's a ball of dust, it will just change its shape. But if it's a solid object, it will experience stresses. And, and those stresses are, the, are controlled by the Ricci tensor. And, and so this is exactly what you're seeing here. Okay. Now, uh, but the most unusual thing about this, which is why most physicists are going to have to take a very large aspirin to digest this is that the wave functions are wave functions on space time not on space right there's already a parameter s which is geodesic time so you're imagining some observer who's observing space time god's eye view einstein's view um but uh but but and they have their own time so s is the god's eye time but and and the particles are events are not are not, are not located at some point they are events at some point in the space time. And these are properties of an event, okay? So the physics, the mathematics is very clean and elegant. And if you're doing geodesics on a, on a spatial, on a space manifold, then you can just take S to be time and you would have ordinary geodesics with, with time. But if you're doing, applying this to, let's say to Riemannian geometry, pseudo Riemannian geometry, where, where the manifold is space time, then actually you would want that, okay? Now, I'm not going to tell you how all that, uh, so the point is, is that this formulation immediately generalizes to non-cognitive case. So we just fix a, a quantum Riemannian geometry, like I told you, so one forms, a derivative, a metric, a Levy-Tapita connection, actually it can just be any left connection. Um, and, uh, um, but it could, for example, be the Levy-Tapita connection. If you want to get ordinary geodesics in the classical limit, the geodesics of the metric manifold, then you should take the leverage of either connection. Um, now, a left connection like this will imply a right connection on the space of, on the, on the vector fields, space of vector fields. These are left module maps from omega one into A. And then because it's a bimodule connection, you can convert the, the left, the right connection back into a left connection by applying the split map. So that converts it back into a left, a left connection, chi into chi, omega one tends to chi. Um, now, once you've got a left connection, now you can just apply the evaluation 
of, of uh, from omega-1 tensor chi into A, just evaluating the whole. Um, and that will give you a function. So that is the divergence operator. Now we'll have a, we want to assume a positive linear functional that is compatible with the divergence. So in classical geometry, if you want to do the, the densities on, a, on an evolving manifold, you would take the, the, met, the, the, the measure, which is the Riemann measure compatible with the metric. You would take square root of determinant minus G or something like that, square root of determinant uh, G and um, uh, in local coordinates. And so, we, but we want something like that. So we, and that's really, the, the essence of that is really that the integral of a divergence should be zero. Then you need conditions on unitarity that, uh, that the flow should be unitary. I mean, you want things, everything to be compatible with the star structure so that things will become real in the classical limit. And that amounts to these conditions here. And this sort of says that star um, is compatible, of, of, you know, the, the vector, applying a vector is compatible with star, at least inside the integral. Now, th that's the general theory. Uh, which goes back to Edwin's paper, original paper. But more recently, we tried to figure out a natural way of simplifying this. And then natural simplification is when, when, when integral is a, is, is a, is a trace. It, that, so a, um, a twisted trace means that it's not a trace. A trace usually means that integral of AB should be integral of BA. But you can throw in an automorphism here. And that's typical for quantum groups, for example. Um, and so... And then we, we ask that this automorphism extends to omega one. And then in that case, you can define a star structure on the space of vector fields, where X is a vector field in chi, a hom, and then its star is defined by this for all C in omega one. And sigma hat here is the, is the, is the, um, the, the braiding associated to this left connection. Um, okay, so in that case, the unitarity is automatically solved if you take if you if you let your vector field be real in the sense that the star should equal of x star should basically be x, but twisted by the automorphism. And and if you take for k s, you can solve this one. If you take k s to be half of the divergence, which is what it would be classically, so everything looks much nicer in this case. The geodesic velocity equations, when you write them all out, then look like this. And as you can see. This is exactly, it mirrors the quantum, the classical case, because the classical case was this equation here. And here we have exactly the same equation, except that I forgot to change T into S because these are, um, yeah, I just forgot um, while preparing this talk. Uh, so so put, imagine S here, not T. Um, and so this term here is the one, something you wouldn't see classically. It's the commutator of the vector field with, with the divergence kappa. And this term here is just evaluating the vector field itself against this right connection, against nabla chi, which was a right connection. So that is what it would be classically. Okay, and then the amplitude flow equation also makes sense, being very careful about the order of terms. Psi dot is minus, so again here, we had this equation here, and this minus a half divergence is kappa. So it's just, minus psi kappa, minus the vector field itself evaluated against d psi. So all of that now makes sense. And all I've got to show you is some nice examples. So the first example um, I want to show you is uh, two by two matrices, okay? So the, you know, it's the nicest, the simplest example, well, not the very simplest, but the nicest example of a small two-dimensional, well, a small, uh, uh, not, uh, small quantum geometry. The calculus here is two-dimensional. The omega one. It. There, I mean, there is a natural calculus. Let's just say, which is what we use in the yellow book, and it has a basis, a central basis S and T of one forms. So that means every other one form is combination of S and T with functions out front, its coefficients, and it has an exterior derivative, and. There's, you know, there's a CP one's worth of of, of possibilities, but then so without too much loss of, loss of generality, you can just fix fix the direction. So this is so I fixed a particular element of omega one, which is what's going on here. But anyway, here's so E one two is the matrix with one in the in the zero in the one two component uh, and zero elsewhere, and E two one is the other side. 
And so this is this is this defines the derivative. These S and T are nothing to do with time, unfortunately. They're just the one form, the basis one forms. The dimension of this calculus and, and the higher order calculus is that S and T actually have to commute, not anti-commute, which is a bit weird, and they square to zero. This calculus has dimension, the dimension in each degree are one, two, one. So it looks like a two manifold. And in fact, it has non-trivial cohomology. So it looks a bit like a, like a torus, if anything, um, but from the homological point of view. Now we take a metric on it. There again, there's a, a large, there's a, there's a, you can take any, because there's a central, because there's a central basis, you can take, 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 take any two by two invertible matrix with coefficients uh, in A. Um, but we'll just take G to be to be S tensor S plus T tensor T, like Euclidean metric, if you like, in, in some sense. And then you can solve for the levity leader connections. They're not, in our framework, they're not unique, but there is um, a three-dimensional moduli in this case, which contains within it a one-parameter moduli, which so uh, just to simplify the formula, I'm just going to focus on the one-parameter moduli, where rho is, a, is an imaginary parameter. Then the left connection, uh, which is what I, I didn't have the L before, but anyway, the left connection is just given by, these, by this formula. You see it turns a one form into something in omega one tends to another one form. Um, okay, the lifting map, the natural way, if you get, get bearing in mind this, that we want to split the projection, because that's symmetric, the lifting map should actually be symmetric here. And so we actually take plus and not minus. That's how we'd lift a two, a, a two form into a one form incompatible with the wedge product. And that then gives you the Ricci tensor. And I'm going to focus on Ricci to be plus or minus i. So that means the two by two matrices have a natural Ricci flat geometry, um, which non-trivial Ricci flat geometry, uh, which is given by this. Now for the integration, I'm going to take the trace. Okay, that's an obvious thing to take for a two by two for a matrix algebra is to take the trace. That is where the word trace comes from. And um, and this is this is this is divergence compatible. Well, the um, everything everything works. The star structure um, Im implied by the theorem that I mentioned tells you that the fi. I didn't tell you what the structure is here, but s star is t and t star uh, s star is can't remember now t or minus t can't remember, but the um, uh, I think it's minus t, uh, and so the corresponding dual basis, f, f s star is minus f t, and uh, if you write a vector field, expand it in the basis with these coefficients x s and x t, then those coefficients should obey this for a real for a real vector field, and then everything works. Zeta is just the identity map, and kappa just works out like this. Okay, so what does the geodesic look like? So the duties of velocity equation then looks like this. This is the velocity equation. I mean, you have to do a lot of calculation, obviously, to get there. Uh, this is the, the um, uh, and also we impose something I didn't mention, that this velocity equation should you know, be consistent with the star structure. That's part of the theory. So that tells you automatically what the other half obeys by applying star. The, um, the other components. And then the GD's the amplitude flow equation is, if you remember, it's 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 x applied to deep psi. So this is the part of deep psi. This is the s component of deep psi. All right. This is the s component of deep psi, and this is the t component of deep psi. So so this is x of deep psi, and then minus psi kappa. And um, and now I'll give you an example here. We start off with psi to be the identity matrix. So psi is it one 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 two two one two two? They are the entries of the matrix. Okay, uh, so they, so they are an element of the algebra. Psi is an element of the algebra. Right? Psi is in the algebra A, but the A is two by two matrices. But it's evolving in time, in geodesic time. So we start off at zero geodesic time with the identity matrix, as you can see here. The one one component is zero. Um, and also the two two component is zero, and the one two and the two zero two one components are sorry is is one, one, and the one two and the two one components are zero, and then you let the whole thing evolve, and you on the complex plane. So these are the original imaginary parts of each psi component, um, on the complex plane. And if you do it to large time, you get this pretty picture. Okay, so there's a lot of 
there's a lot going on. I would say it's only partly understood. I wanted to, I haven't got too much time, so I want to tell you what happens in just a complementary example. We'll take the integers. So the integer lattice, not the half line this time, but the entire line. And because that's actually a group, on a, uh, because Z is a group, on any group, the first thing you do if you're a geometer is you figure out left a basis of left invariant forms, because then you can trivialize the tangent bundle and uh, work with everything much cotangent bundle. So that's what happens here. I told you that the graph was a sum over all the arrow, that the one forms were all arrows. So here we define E plus to be all the arrows that go in the going to the right, and E minus to be all the arrows going to the left, and we add them all up. That gives you E plus and E minus. And then the, these are based on very simple relations. Even though the algebra is infinite, so that this is not actually a Hopf algebra because it's because the group is infinite. But the there are, but the omega one is still a perfectly good, nice uh, um, module. It's, it's just two dimensional free module over the algebra with a basis e plus and e minus. And the bimodule structure is given by telling you what happens when I try to commute a function past the e plus. When I move it to the to the left, it picks up a, a, a translation. The r plus of f. At, at i is f of i plus one. It's the, left, it's the translation by i, shift by i. And, and then, um, the, then the, the derivative is just given by the partial derivatives in the basis. And the partial derivatives are just the finite differences. So that's exactly what you'd use in, in the lattice in, in integral systems for the left and right translation operators, right? And, and the differential will be the difference, the translation minus identity. So these are the finite difference operators, but there are two of them. And the and not one, and that's and that makes the, the geometry of omega of z to actually be two dimensional, not one dimensional. And it's only in the continuum limit where d plus is minus d minus, uh, so they become independent. They can become dependent, linearly dependent, only in the in the continuum limit. But as soon as you it's non commutative, it actually the count is actually two dimensional intrinsically. Now the metric will have to look like this because of what I told you about being in the center. Um, in order to be in the center, it has to have this form with E plus, you know, with the total degree here, plus or minus, have to add up to zero. So, uh, and, but with some function here and some, and, and the corresponding translative function here. And what this function here is, is a function over the, man, over the manifold, over Z, which just means a function HI at each I. And that, and that just corresponds to the weight you would attach in either direction at, at the node between I and I plus one. So that's fixed. Uh, the picture I had before. So either think of the metric as attaching an, a weight, a real number weight to every every edge here, the same in both directions, or a function in the algebra. And then the connection specified on the basis just looks like this. And you can see that without going into too much detail, you can see that it's a kind of ratio derivative. Rho here, this row, not nothing to do with the other row, is is the is the multiplicative ratio when you step in one direction. So it's like a derivative multiplicative derivative when you go R plus of H divided by H. So it's how much H varies from point to point. And that's what enters into the connection. So it's like a derivative of the metric. And you can work out the curvature. The curvature will be a double derivative of the metric. And the scalar curvature works out to be like this. Um, so as you can see here, it's, um, well, I don't think I need to say too much about this. Um, it's just a formula. But what's really interesting about this formula is that if you then integrate it, now what should be the integration? Well, we don't really know. We don't, you know, we sort of play it by ear a little bit, but obviously it's going to be a sum over all the points to integrate a function. But what is the measure? The measure classically might be square root of determinant of, of the metric or something, but we don't really know what the dimension of the manifold is. Is it one dimensional? Is it two dimensional? So we just play it around. But the natural thing to do is to put HI itself. And if you put HI itself, then uh, it fits all the conditions I had be I required before, which is a good way of checking it. But it also gives you the Einstein-Hilbert action. Um, and so that Einstein-Hilbert action is just integrate this with H. Now this H here cancels this H, so you just get this. When you, when you, you can rewrite it like this using the fact that the, in, the sum is translation invariant. And what you get is just rho delta Z rho, where delta Z is the usual discrete lattice Laplacian, right? So shift plus plus shift minus minus twice the identity. That's what delta Z is. So what that means is, is that quantum gravity is a function integral of integrating over all possible rows with this, with this action. So that actually looks like a scalar field theory. Only it isn't a scalar field theory because rho 
is a positive number. It's, 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 a, it's a real, it's an R plus valued, real, it's like a tropical scalar field theory, but, but tropicalized. It has values in R plus, uh, which, is, which makes it very much more interesting than a scalar field. And that's what, so that's what gravity, quantum gravity looks like. Now I want to show you geodesics. I'm just going to focus on the very simplest case, um, which is rho equals uh, um, the constant case. So the metric is just one everywhere, a constant everywhere. So the ratio r plus a h over h is just one. So it's a constant metric. So that's like a flat, flat lattice. Right. I mean, these lattices, they can, because of the two-dimensional calculus, they can admit curvature, as I've, as I've alluded, alluded to. But here we just take the flat case. So the, so the connection on E plus and minus is just zero. You have the trace, you have the reality condition, and the reality condition just comes out to be um, that if you write X plus, X, X minus is determined from X plus, the same as it, as it was in the other example. So we just focus on X plus. If you write x plus in polar coordinates, r and e to the i theta, just a polar description, then the velocity equation comes down to these two things. One is that r dot is zero, so r, the, rate, the radius doesn't evolve. So the modular square of x plus is constant. And the other is that uh, is, is for theta, and it obeys this interesting equation. I mean, again, in consistency, it's quite natural to replace something linear by, by sine. This is uh, what's going on here. Then the um, amplitude flow equation. So then you, so you solve this equation. And here's the solution of it. I start off with theta to be a bump function. So theta at time is zero is just a Gaussian. I sampled, I, we, sampled, we sampled the Gaussian uh, here where it, it goes on to infinity, but we just work with functions with support, let's say between zero and a hundred. So we stay away from the edges. Everything has, all the action takes place between zero and a hundred, i equals zero up to i equals a hundred. And I have a Gaussian sampled, uh, a sampled Gaussian centered at some value here. Um, looks like, if I remember correctly, it's 50, i equals 50. And then, and then you let it evolve. And you can see that as it evolves, it acquires kind of wave-like component. It's still, it's still real, but it acquires this kind of wave packet-like feature. Then we, then we take the, then, then we take that, GD, that velocity and then we look at the G amplitude flow. So again, so now we're solving this equation, which is the amplitude flow equation. Kappa is a certain function. It's, it's something like one plus uh, r cos theta. Kappa, that's kappa. And we, um, we look at the evolution. Um, yeah, so that's part of the loss equation. And this one was applying, this applies x to deep psi. So deep psi has a d plus component and a d minus component multiplied by x plus and x minus. So this is what it looks like. And um, so then you can solve that. And for that particular theta, it looks like this. Now, what's really interesting here is that just as we saw before in this other example, well, you can see this here, that um, we start off with a Gaussian, real psi, and the imaginary part is zero. So we start off with psi to be real. And then in, if you apply the formalism of, formalism of quantum geodesics to a classical Riemannian manifold, then a real vector field will stay real, and a real psi will stay real. So you don't. So you might as well work with with densities rho, and that's the same thing as working with particles. So you really, really just doing ordinary Riemannian geometry. But in the quantum case, we see that even if you start off with everything real, because of the uh, of the um, the here, here it's the lattice the lattice deformation because of the non commutativity coming out of the lattice, the the, the GDC flow intrinsically becomes quantum. The wave function may start off real, but it, but it becomes, has it gets an imaginary component and, and you get this wave-like behavior. It actually becomes a wave packet. So as the, as the flow evolves, it, it, the, initially it looks like a bump function, could be a classical geodesic, but it evolves into a wave packet due to quantum effects. Those quantum effects come from the lattice. So in a way, uh, and I should say this also happens in this, in this example here. We started off real, but we saw very quickly we entered the complex plane. Right, it becomes complex um, with these pretty pictures. So, so there's, um, so I, I wouldn't say, make too much out of this, and I wanted to cover a bit more before my time runs out. Um, I did start five minutes late. Is that going to be a problem? Okay. Um, so uh, this hint, this hints at the necessity of quantum mechanics 
even if you, due to, if we believe that Planck scale causes non-commutativity or discreteness of space-time, then this tells you that this is why you have to have quantum theory. If you solve it off classically, your digits would evolve and they'd become wave functions. So it's like an origin of quantum mechanics or necessity of quantum mechanics. Okay, to, speaking of which, I wanna say in a very quick, because uh, uh, I've only got five minutes, just another application. Right? You don't have to be interested in Planck scale physics. You can be interested in any place where there's not gonna be algebra. And the other place is just in ordinary standard quantum mechanics. So this is this uh, preprint here with, with Edwin. Just take the usual Heisenberg algebra, okay? Nothing, nothing special, textbooks since 1924. Um, now, when we take a Hamiltonian uh, to be the usual one, kinetic plus potential. What's new is what should we take for the differential calculus? And the natural differential calculus we take is that is we take a one-dimensional extension. We are forced into this calculus. I haven't got time to tell you all the theorems, but we're forced to this calculus, which is a 2n plus one-dimensional calculus, one dimension higher, and with an extra generator theta prime. And theta prime is central. And later on, it will become D of the geodesic time, becomes DS. Theta prime is really DS. Anyway, um, uh, you, with this commutation relation between differentials of momentum and momentum, these are the commutation relations between differentials of position and position. Okay. Then this calculus has a property that admits an, uh, it, it admits a solution of the geodesic velocity equation. And um, here we solve for both the pair of a connection, Nabla. We don't have we don't have Riemannian geometry, but we solve for a connection nabla and a geodesic velocity equation dependent on nabla uh, for a vector field. So this is the joint solution, and so this excess obeys the geodesic velocity equation, and the amplitude flow is all cooked up. So the amplitude flow is just Schrodinger's equation. So the bottom line is is that Schrodinger's equation is really is literally is geodesic flow of a wave function um, on this on the Heisenberg algebra. So it really couldn't be nicer. Um, but you might say, well, where is the metric? What does Nabla respect? Well, it is compatible with some kind of metric. Uh, this metric is actually this guy here. As you can see, it's really the more like the symplectic form. It's D dp tensor dx minus dx tensor dp plus some other pieces. OK, this whole theory extends to the relativistic case. I've really only got like one minute now. Um, so. Relativistic quantum mechanics is something which is, I would say, not fully understood, um, even though it's really a special case of quantum field theory. So physicists don't want to understand it. But there is something going on there. And one thing in our paper is we call, I don't even know what if physicists have a name for this, if I have studied it, but we call this electromagnetic Heisenberg algebra. So think of, of quantum mechanics relativistic coupled to an external gauge field with curvature f. There's a very natural associative algebra defined like this, where the Jacobi identity holds because of the Bianchi identity. And, um, and we call that electromagnetic Heisenberg algebra. And we look at the klein gordon flow. So we're not trying to solve the Schrodinger equation, we're trying to solve, not solve, but we're trying to use the flow generated by the klein gordon operator, okay? That's something you wouldn't do in the physics. In physics, you would only be looking at the zero modes of the klein, or the, the eigen modes of the klein gordon operator, but we want to think of it as generating a flow. And what is, so again, we go to the same procedure, the natural calculus, there's a natural uh, such that it emits a connection and a thing. Then we're going. There's a this calculus has a natural calculus has a natural quotient where we where we set uh, dx zero to be theta prime, and this is this would be exactly consistent in, relati in relativity with theta prime theta prime being ds where x was the proper time. So that would that would give you the relativistic formula you're used to when you when you uh, okay. Then uh, I just want to show you just an example. Well. In order to compute examples, it's very natural to fix to take the wave function phi, and and look and and look at the and diagonalize it in time. So we look at the energy component. We look at things of the form e to the i omega t times some function of x, psi, capital psi of x, and then the whole thing reduces to something which then deforms just in terms of the, similar to the. It looks like now like the, like the, the quantum mechanics Heisenberg algebra. But the commutation relations are deformed by the curvature of A. And this all works if we take the components of the gauge field to be time independent in our, in our so in, we fix a gauge for that. And then with a, with a modified Hamiltonian, which looks like this. So it becomes a deformation of the high, for each time, each time eigenmode, it becomes or energy eigenspace. You look at, you focus on a particular energy sector of the theory, it becomes. Uh, or it becomes the de deformation of relativist of non-relativistic quantum mechanics, and then again we take a weight we take a, a weight packet centered on 
on, on the momentum, which would be the classical momentum uh, for that energy U. We fix the energy U, and for that momentum, there would be this value of moment, that energy that is this value of momentum. We could look at the wave packet centered on that, and we let it evolve. And here's the real part, and here's the amplitude. We see it spreads out, but maintain, maintains mass one. If you look at the excitation values of X and T, excitation values of, of, P, of P looks like this, uh, X looks like this. You can see that this is the velocity. Um, this is exactly what you'd expect for a, for a freely for a particle with proper time s free particle. The t operator is this, and it looks like this, which is exactly what you would get for the relativistic uh, time if you use the formula of special relativity. So it fits perfectly. I think that is a good place to stop because I have run out of time. I won't tell you the rest of the theory behind this, but there is more theory, a lot of mathematics uh, behind it, which is in the paper to do with bimodule connections, etc., and links up with jet bundles and stuff like that. Okay. Thank you. Questions? Yeah. Yeah. It's, yes, it in, it, 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 yes, you could write the D, the D here is 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 d is is given by theta. Theta is e plus plus e minus. Yeah. Um, well, there there is there is a Laplacian associated to the to any quantum Riemannian geometry, but that's not what we used here. We looked at the Einstein-Hilbert action. What? Oh, you can look at it, but it, it is it, you again just in in you get you you get the the you get the usual delta z, but with a weight given by h. Yeah. Okay. Because you, yeah. It's a okay. It's a weighted Laplacian. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. You get that. You get that. Yeah. You. I. I didn't mention that, but in every every quantum Riemannian geometry in the general formalism, if you just apply d. You apply d to a, d to a function, and then you're in omega one. Then you apply Nabla. You're in omega one tensor omega one. Then you apply the round bracket. You're back in A. Oh yeah, yes, 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 yes. The theory works nicely on Cayley graphs. And well, the Z is an example of a Cayley graph. More questions. Okay. Uh, here's my, uh, the beginning of the next slide. Okay. Uh, so we're not going to attend the end part of the